Welcome, everyone. I'm Carol Fitzgerald from readinggroupguides.com, a website from the Book Report Network, and the host of the Book Reporter Talks to Video podcast series. Welcome to our Bookachino Live event, where our guest this evening is Joyce Maynard, and we are going to be discussing her novel, Count the Ways, which I completely enjoyed. Now, little thing, I got this book as a galley last year and didn't get to it, like sadly didn't get to it. So this year, when we decided to have Joyce as, as a guest, I immediately plucked it off my shelf. And yes, I folded down a lot of pages because I have so much to talk to her about. I was so happy to hear this week that she is working on a sequel to uh, Count the Ways, which is going to be very, very exciting. We'll hear a little bit from her about that later on. And that's had her clocking some very early mornings, for those of you who follow her on social media, and some very late nights. So I really, really thank her for spending the time with us this evening. So here's how the format tonight is going to go. Let me start by noting that we are assuming that everyone has read the book, and we are going to be talking spoilers. So this was a read the book in advance kind of an event. I'm going to begin with a discussion with Joyce. And then a few members of the audience will be joining us live to share their questions. And then we're going to be taking questions from you as the evening goes on. So drop them into that Q&A down below. And our editorial director will be handling those questions later on. Just keep in mind that the chat is uh, shared with all of you. And the Q&A is just shared with the uh, panelists. So feel free to talk about yourselves if you would like. And with that, that housekeeping behind us, let's welcome Joyce to the stage. There's Joyce. How are Hi. you? <laughs> With the I fire like the fire. party. It's so exciting. <laughs> I have to tell you, Carol, and everybody who's listening, that you're like the first person I've seen in a while. <laughs> so excuse me if I'm a little overexcited. I'm, um, I have a rather um, unusual method of writing. It, it's not unusual for me, but I know it, it's unlike some people. Um, I just go and I sequester myself in a very big way. I, I stock up on food and I go to some little place where nobody can get to me, which happens to be my um, little cottage in New Hampshire that normally I would not be at this time of year. So <laughs> it's a bit it's a bit brisk, but that's okay. And I have barely been out into the world. I, I get up really early and I take a walk and I look at this lake that's outside my window. And then I'm actually not alone because I've been spending my, my days with my characters and you know, you yes. know, about so anyway, I'm, uh, I actually am a very sociable person. So this will be a treat for me to get to hear from readers. You know, I also like that you've been posting pictures of the light across the lake, the person yes, across the lake. Yes, there's one person left. There's actually one year-round person who I think has central heating, which I do not. You can see my fire <laughs> going behind me. Um, a little sleeping bag so from the And I, it actually, it's really comforting to see their light across the lake. Um, uh, but other than that, I see the stars, and now I'm seeing you, so... And you're not swimming this time of year. I was wondering. Well, I actually do go into the water very, very quickly. I don't stay in, but I, I go in briefly. Yeah. I always admire you because you're always out swimming. It can be like, you know, super cold. You're still out there. I would put the wetsuit on in my pool. Let's put it that way. <laughs> September, jumping into the wetsuit, which is really hard to do, you know? I'm a water person. Yes, definitely. Definitely. So you have said that you like to write about the human drama of human relationships, the drama that goes on with people and Count the Ways definitely explores that. Did you have all these characters in place before you started writing? Did you know who everybody was? Well, I know the beginning. It's a little bit like, um, like making a family. You start out, well, I started out with my character, Eleanor. And when we meet her, she's very young. Um, she's come from a, a difficult, challenging family um, herself. It's the 70s. She actually, she's not me, but her, her vintage matches mine. So she was born in the 50s and came of age in the 60s and 70s. And, and then she meets Cam. It's a very romantic coming together. They meet at a craft fair. He's he's making wooden bowls out of burls and they fall. He has a goat with him and they they live on a farm and have children. So my characters sort of my story expands the way families do. And one by one, their children are born. And then, of course, their children, other people come into their lives. And before you know it, Cam's playing on a softball team and suddenly we've got 
the men on the softball team and their wives and one of their children who has a terrible thing happen. And, and it's like life. Um, so no, I don't start out knowing everybody. And I know this is probably different from what you hear from, I know you speak to many writers and you probably speak to some who say they know exactly how the book is going to end. I know John Irving says he knows the last sentence. Mm -hmm. That's not me. I, um, I know who my characters are, but they actually lead me to the story because they, at some point, they take on lives of their own. And I'm, this happened today. Something happened that I really wasn't expecting to be to be happening in my story. But this was what would happen with this character, and it did. And I followed along. Wow, that's so wonderful. Eleanor's got this great line when she's writing the four panel pieces about their lives. She felt that these put a frame around the events of the day in a way that took on a significance that they might not otherwise have possessed. And I love that line about what she's writing because it could be folding the laundry. It could be talking to the children. It's something. And I feel like- writing a, She explains, she writes, she does a comic strip. Yeah, comic so the strip. four panel pieces are the, are the pictures in the strip. Um, and um, I guess I, I, you know, I will say that I was somewhat inspired by the fact that when my kids were young, I wrote a syndicated newspaper column. It was called mm -hmm. Domestic Affairs. And I, with words, did some of what Eleanor does with, with her artwork. I was locating the meaning in the seemingly very mundane day in, day out of a family's life and, and locating the beauty, sometimes the tragedy um, or the pain at least, um, and um, giving it shape. Um, and that's, that's what Eleanor does too. Yeah, I love these little, like, this is what happened this week. This is our family. It is encapsulated. And then yeah. you go back and look. I've been doing some looking back on boxes from people. Like, I shoved all the boxes of my kids' memorabilia in the closet where they had to fix the air conditioner. And all of a sudden, they came uh -huh. flying back at me, all seven of them. And it's really interesting because you go see these little pieces that you saved during the years. Yeah, then I'm just, I'm just getting over that. Seven children. Seven <laughs> boxes, seven. Wow. No, no, I have two children in seven boxes. No, oh, no, no. Boxes. Okay. No, this okay. is just second grade. This is not like just <laughs> second grade. Are you kidding? I, I saved every little bloody paper these children sent home. But it's like in these little vignettes, I just loved it because it's this, this is what the family did this week. This is what the family did this week. And I think it's just so special. She's also an artist who writes children's books and greeting card copy at points. I just love all the different things she did. Are you artistic? Kind of like me. I mean, I was always, I was supporting a family. Right. I was a single parent for a lot of the years that I was raising my kids and I did a whole lot of different stuff. It was always writing, but it was okay. different kinds. So you were never an artist. You were never, are you, would you like I to, love draw? to draw? I love to draw. And you know, one of the joys for me in my writing life is that I get to I get to be other people and I get to explore sort of other identities. I mean, I've been a boy in my books. I, in Labor Day, I, I, I took on a, the, the voice of a 13 year old boy. Um, so no, I've never been a professional artist, but I always draw. And anybody who's ever gone to a reading of mine and has a book that I sign knows that I always, I always draw in um, my books. Oh, I could just tell. I could just, I could feel that you were excited about it as a way to communicate with people. I could just uh, tell just reading. My father was an artist. And so I, I always made art, made, made art with him. But, but mm -hmm. I, um, um, I, my characters do things that I wish I could do better. Um, I've had a dancer. I've had, I mean, I, 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 I've lived many lives in books. Many, many lives. Do you know, I really love also the part where it's kind of grounded us in time with about the challenger and Ursula's obsession with the challenger, just to get what was going to happen. And I remember that time so well, we yes. knew everybody going up on the flight. We knew everything that was going on. And while those events didn't, didn't uh, definitely impact just us, they didn't impact us, you know, in our day-to-day -day lives. I think they were shared by everybody. It was just shared by everybody of what was going on. And I felt that like looking at that, it was a perfect backdrop for the story of something that was so newsworthy. It wasn't a war. It wasn't, it was something where if you were in school at that particular age, that was your obsession. And yep. did you come on that one easily or did you? Well, it was, there? Um, I, there's actually a book that I keep on my desk whenever I write a novel and it's called 
Chronicle of the 20th Century. It's now you know out of print, obviously, because we're in another whole century. But I, I often my books often start you know some years back, um, and what it is is one page for every day of the 20th century in this very big heavy book. I even carry it with me when I'm going off to some place to to write. Um, one of the things that I love to do when I tell um, a story, and it's usually about you know, families and relationships is explore the intersection between the little stories that we live out, little, little and big, in our houses, in our yards, in our home, in our cars, and the big things that are going on in the world, you know, and and the way they enter our lives. I, um, For anybody my age, you know, one of the certainly, you know, probably the first really huge one was the Kennedy assassination. Mm -hmm. I was I was 10 um, and I didn't, it's, those events are not just something we experience reading the newspaper. They're, they're in our living room. They're, mm -hmm. you know, seeing our mother cry or, you know, seeing our teacher, you know, turn off the TV set. And um, so throughout Count the Ways, the Challenger is certainly one of the, the big ones that I, I kind of focused in on, but the world is always going on. The book is full of things that I either remembered or was reminded by from my Chronicle of the 20th Century book. Um, it's full of music and it was, mm -hmm. it's, it's got a sort of a playlist that goes from 1973 to 2009. The, the, um, the last day on the book is, of the book is the day Michael Jackson died, um, a complicated day, um, complicated for the family in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, and I love, I think very few of us today um, live our lives disconnected from those events. And sometimes they are, you know, big, you know, major, you know, September 11th or, mm -hmm. um, but they might be um, the death of Princess Diana. They mm -hmm. might be, um, well, John Lennon's shooting is in this book. The Vietnam War is in the book. Um, and not as, um, not me sort of holding forth on the event, but just the tapestry of life, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Just before I came up here, this is the 10th anniversary of Hurricane Superstore in Sandy. Oh, and we were yes. watching TV and they were doing a special on it for an hour. And we were watching and I said to my husband, you realize we saw none of this. And he goes, how? I go, we didn't have television for two weeks. Yes, of course. So all these news stories of, we yeah, yeah. heard what was happening. I said, this is the first time I've seen a lot of these pictures. Wow. And for those yeah. two weeks, we had no power. And I said, wow. remember the generator? Like, remember connecting the refrigerator? Remember these things? The long cords connecting the neighbors? And yeah. there are those times in your life that you, you can just anchor everything because it happened that year. Yeah. That's what happened. That's where we were. Yeah. So, yeah. so um, there were also distinct parts to the book by like part one part two did you know those at the beginning were you doing those natural breaks or did that come more towards editing um it was very organic and it usually is I have to say I um let's see I'll, I'll, you can see there's a whiteboard there there's a whiteboard there I, I have giant whiteboards all around me where I'm scribbling things I most certainly don't have an outline um the book is written in chapters, many of which are very short. I think I was really affected years ago by the fact that my writing life was lived while I was uh, raising young children. So I was writing short things that I could sort of do in the space of a, a child's nap. The book is actually broken into these chapters and without intending, it is 100 chapters. And some of the chapters are just a page. Um, right, right, right. Uh, as, uh, this is actually my longest, the longest of my, of my novels. I've, I've published 10 novels um, so far, um, actually, one came out today. I want to say I. It's and we're going to talk about that. It was so exciting. Um, but, for you. but ten sort of full-length books, and um, this is the biggest one. And I mean it not just in number of pages, but sort of the biggest story. It follows forty years in the life of a family, from you know falling in love and beginning to be a parent. Um, something that I'm watching my children do now, and raising children and. And in Eleanor and Cam's case, as it was in mine, divorce. Um, but I also didn't want to end the story of this family with divorce because that's not the end of the story. I, um, and it's not really the end of the family. I, I think I was greatly shaped and I'm <clears throat> traumatized by the way so much of our culture looks at divorce as this um, 
you know, this ending, this death. I mean, certainly it felt like that to me. My children were five, seven, and 11 when my marriage ended. I think the children in, in my book are, are close to that um, when their parents part. And um, I wanted to follow, follow them through into adulthood and to the reverberations of that. I, I, remember, I remember there was a, a very popular psychologist at the time she was going on, you know, places like Phil Donahue, and I don't know if Oprah quite existed yet then, um, talking about, you know, the terrible effects of divorce on children. It was such a guilt-inducing thing. You know, you are destroying your child's life. Mm -hmm. And to a, to a parent like me, I'll just say to a parent, you know, the idea of, con of bringing, bringing grief and, and that level of pain to your own beloved children is so terrible. I wanted to explore the way this family navigates that. And there are no villains. It's, I don't just follow the mother, I follow the father too and his remarriage and the child he has with his second wife who does become a big part of Eleanor's life too. It's family takes many forms. Um, you know, I, I mentioned earlier, Carol, that when I was younger, when my kids were young, I, I used to one of the 10,000 jobs that I had, but it was actually one dearest to my heart, um, was writing a weekly syndicated newspaper column about family life. It was called Domestic Affairs. And I'd been doing it for almost 10 years when my own marriage ended. Mm -hmm. And about half the newspapers that ran that column dropped it at that point. Wow. It ran 50 papers. This was 1989. This is not ancient history, but I will always remember the, the observation, uh, the explanation given by the editor. I think it was at the Chicago Tribune that um, now that Joyce Maynard is divorced, she is no longer equipped to write, no longer qualified to write about family. Wow. Just wow. think about that. And I mean, I mean, think about, first of all, how many divorced people there are in the world, but the the limited definition of what family is which mm -hmm. can be a single parent can be two men two women uh, friends getting together increasingly this is happening sort of you know pulling forces to joining forces mm -hmm. to support each other raising their children um and i think i brought all of that my own experience you know you asked me where these characters came from i'm always in my books i'm mm -hmm. always there i just I'm I'm a bit of a chameleon. I take lots of forms. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I see. I see Bonnie saying, "Was that editor a man?" I wonder. Yeah, I was a man, but you know, women did some of this stuff too. Mm -hmm. I have to say, they're not alone. We were men are not alone in everything that they do. They truly are not. You know, you've got these really clever chapter titles. I loved reading the chapter title. That way, how's that going to affect the story? Like, what is it? Did you do this first or do those later? You no, I did it afterwards. It was really fun. I um I have the book here. There, I sort of I didn't give it even a lot of thought. It was just, it was just kind of like what came to me, um at the time, and um, um, where the happy people lived. Actually, that title became the title that the French the French edition of this book was became Où vivaient les gens heureux. Mm -hmm. Um, um, a first baseman's wife, black ice, a web footed boy. Um, you know. I, I think I was really shaped young as a writer by the fact that I paid the bills by writing. I, this was not like a sideline. There was no, nobody in the background sort of making sure that, you know, things got taken care of. I had to keep you reading. Mm -hmm. I think it was actually a great lesson for me. I had to keep, I had to keep you turning those pages, you know, or somebody wasn't going to get piano lessons. Um, so I try to keep you reading with these chapter titles. I hope I did. I, I, you definitely did. In fact, I, I want to go back. I like to think I keep you up at night. Yeah, exactly. One more, one more. And the short chapters did it too. Okay. Now the version I read has 444 pages. Okay. Yeah. When I picked this up, I was like, Whoa, this is a big book. In fact, I said to readers, if you're going to read this before the event, you better get started. Like you need to start like right now. But so, people read it fast. Have you it noticed? Is, like, it is fast. It is a fast read. So did you set out to write a long book or did the storytelling demand it? I have so few plans. I can't tell you. I, I mean, that's, 
that's why I'm having as much fun as I am right now writing in this, mm-hmm. you know, this is my idea of fun alone in a, in a <laughs> cold house, you know, eating popcorn for dinner sometimes, but, um, but I am having fun. And part of the reason is I'm, I'm not just writing a book. I'm reading a book. I'm re I'm, I can't wait to find out what happens. And I, I get up really early. So I'll, you know, I can get to the next bit. Um, so no, I did not know how long it was going to be. I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know. I was 20 pages away from the end. I mean, I, I think we can, because a lot of people, I, I think it's wonderful that you, that you do this for a group that has, that you, that you ask them to read, read the book. Yeah, exactly. um, so I was, I was 20 pages away from the end. And those of you who have read it will know that that means the family is converging uh, at the family farm for the wedding of the oldest child who used to be their daughter and is now their son. And this is not a book about gender issues. It's just that as in life, lots of things happen. So this is one of the things that happens. So they're all converging and Eleanor is not married. Cam's marriage has ended. They're all, they haven't seen each other for a long time. They used to be wildly passionately in love. And then they were, you know, passionately in hate. And I didn't know what was going to happen when they got together. I couldn't wait to find out. And it was really like, I was watching this scene, not writing it. Um, And you, you know, I, I think there, there, I remember one, um, one person I was talking to about this saying, oh, well, maybe they can get back together again. I can't give you happily ever after. Yeah, it's, yeah. Um, and my novels, I like to feel that there's something hopeful and redemptive, but I can't give you this happily ever after, but I, I wanna give you truth and hope. And um, I think it's a rather hopeful ending. Oh yeah, because you're just like, okay, wait a second. What did he just say to her? And what did she just say to him? It's just like perfect. It's absolutely perfect. Was Count the Ways always the title? Was that no, always? No, no. Um, so, you know, uh, since you've read the book, if you read the book, that one of the things that this mother does with her children, they live, they live on a farm in New Hampshire, as I did, um, and they live down the road from a waterfall. And every winter, um, every spring, just when the winter has ended and the the first snow is melting. This is a, a, a moment that I remember very well. The, the brook is running really, really fast. And Eleanor has a little tradition with her children. They build little boats, kind of origami type boats. And, and one of the children says, well, you don't have a boat without a passenger. So they make little people to put in the boats and they make them out of corks. So they will float and they're called the cork people. Mm-hmm. I see Debbie, who I remember, who I know, um, saying cork people. So yes, there are these little people and um, Ursula, the, the younger daughter, um, who becomes the only daughter, um, gives names to them all. And they launch these little boats in the stream. And then they run very fast along the edge, kind of watching them go. I, um, I did this with my children when they were little. And I wasn't saying as I was doing it, oh, this is a metaphor for life. But it it has struck me in the years since thinking about those days that that is very much what a parent does. We launch our little people yeah. in their little boats and we run alongside cheering them on. And, you know, we might kind of dislodge them from the tall grasses at some point, but at the end of the day, they're, they, they're going to, you know, sink or we pray float and um, we cannot always take care of them, which, which is one of the big, themes and obsessions of Eleanor's life, trying Mm -hmm. to protect her children, trying Mm -hmm. to spare them pain. And of course, she ends up bringing about with her husband, one of the greatest pains of their life, which is their divorce. Um, So I used to call this book, The Court People. And I love that title. It still, it's kind of the court people in my head. But my editor said, you know, people are going to think this is a book about people in Cork, Ireland. Um, And um, and somebody else said, oh, that is that a book about alcoholism? Um, uh, so I changed it to Count the Ways. Um, I did, I have the most wonderful Facebook community. I actually have two. I have a, an author page and then I have my, my personal page, which it maxes out at 5,000 people. And I always wish I could take more in because I'm, I'm very active on Facebook. Wow. Um, 
And I really know my Facebook friends. When I go in and I say, well, maybe I can eliminate some to make room for some more. I know every one of them. I know where they live. I know their stories. I don't know how this can be, but it is. Um, so I put it out to my Facebook group. Um, what? And I gave them several topic, uh, se several titles. One was a line from a Joni Mitchell song. Joni Mitchell songs sort of appear throughout mm -hmm. the book at different stages. Um, I wish I had a river. So it was. I was thinking about. I wish I had a river. I was thinking about court people. Um, and in the end, I was very happy with Count the Ways. Yeah, let me tell you how. Let me, let me tell you how I love you. Let me count the ways. It's yes, like exactly. immediately, immediately thinking about that. So, okay, tell us what came out today because I know you're really excited about it, and we're going to be excited to read it. So, tell us. It's a it's a novella. It, yes. So, um, I kind of I wasn't ready to start writing this sequel for a whole year, almost two years actually. I've been thinking about this book every single day. I've been thinking about these characters and I've been hearing from readers. Readers of Count the Ways are the most passionate readers of it. I mean, I, I you know, I, I have really loyal readers and I, I've heard from lots of people about all my books, but I've never had an experience like this where people just really are very deeply invested, sometimes angry. Sometimes they're angry with Eleanor. And I don't know if you felt this, but she makes some really poor, Mm -hmm. made poor choices in her life and I've had women write to me and sometimes a couple of men who said I threw that book down on the floor at this particular point when she did this so I felt a huge responsibility to to Eleanor and these characters and in the meantime I wanted to be writing but I wasn't ready to write this sequel so I wrote a short book it's a it's I think it's called an Amazon short story it's actually 102 pages so it's more like a novella called um the influencer mm -hmm. and it was it's a very different i love this book i had a great time writing it it's a completely different sort of story more along the lines of my novel T to die for actually if if uh, anybody knows that book that became a really wonderful movie um with N nicole kidman um it was inspired by a case that i followed kind of obsessively last fall the case of gabby petito and brian laundry two young people in florida who came from Long Island originally, I think, who set out across America in, early, early, in their early 20s, they were, um, with the goal of being influencers, mm -hmm. um, a very 2021 kind of goal. Um, and at one point, Gabby disappeared and Brian came home alone. And there was this terrible sense of dread, where is she? And ultimately her body was found. And you know, many of you will know that story. I did not want to just write a novel telling that story. I, any more than I wanted to write a novel about Pamela Smart when I wrote To Die For. I wanted to explore the obsessions that created that story. And in this case, mm -hmm. it was the obsession with social media and fame and the, the idea of two young people setting out to sort of, to have followers when they themselves were sort of lost. Um, so I wrote this book, The Influencer. I wrote it in my same kind of white heat state that I'm in right now, just hold up, did nothing but that for a very short period of time. And it it came out today. Um, so I'm that's always a big day, you know, when I finally get to share the work. It's it's I should say it's downloadable. If you if you have Amazon Prime or Kindle Unlimited, it's free. And they've made a great audio version of it with an actress playing all the roles. Usually I record the audiobooks and I, I kind of love to do that and I think I'm good at it, but but this one we gave to an actress. So it's out today. It's um it's a dollar ninety nine if you're not Amazon Prime. But um um I'm hoping that people and it and as I said, you will not find another count the ways. It's a completely different voice of mine. Well, do you know, what I really love is that people are doing these shorts. And I keep telling our editorial director and I are talking about the audio shorts that people are doing, the novellas that people are doing, and how we're going to cover them on the site. Because yeah. authors are doing things that are exciting that their readers might miss. Like you're great on social media. Some people are okay on social media. And there are a lot of readers that aren't on social media, but they right. do read our newsletter. So yeah. how do I tell them? So we're going to be working on that over these next couple of months mm -hmm. of because there's so many people that are doing fabulous things in between, but it will keep their readers reading or they'll have new people discovering them. And that's what we're all about. You know, I'm, I'm a sort of word of mouth writer. I have to say, um, I have never been, a, um, 
I won't say never, but since the publication of my memoir at Home in the World, um, I have continued to haul along a, a you know, a, a, a Googleable identity that is that is frustrating to me that has to do with, you know, one part of my life that happened actually 50 years ago. Um, and I'm not shy to talk about it when I was 18 years old and I published my first sort of big story in the New York Times and got a thousand letters in two days. One was from J.D. Salinger saying, basically, I will be your friend mm -hmm. and wanting, as it turned out, to be more than my friend. I dropped out of Yale, gave up my full scholarship, cut off my relationships with the world pretty much to be with him. And later he sent me away in a pretty painful fashion a year later. And for 25 years, I never told that story. When I did, I was really canceled. I was I was an unpublishable writer. I would yeah. appear somewhere and people would walk out. I mean, famous writers would get up en masse and walk out. Um, and I, to some degree, even today in the post Me Too era, although I'm quite sure that if that book were published today, and I'm really proud of that book, I it would be viewed very differently, but I'm still not, like a literary insider. I'm mm -hmm. the writer who slept with Salinger. I've mm -hmm. published 19 books. And you know, what does it say about how we look at women that that would still be like the first line? But um, what has saved me, and more than saved me, what has sort of, you know, sustained and nurtured and, and, and nurtured me well have been readers. Mm -hmm. So the way I survive as a writer is not big ads, you know, on the back of a magazine or, you know, 30 reviews in all the, you know, Tony literary journals, it's readers and mm -hmm. readers spreading the word. I, you know, at first I was thinking, oh my gosh, everybody who's on this, you know, has already read the book, but you can tell your friends. <laughs> that's what, that's what my readers do. My really loyal readers. And in fact, they can tell their friends. They can also get today as it happens, just when I'm talking with you, um, count the ways is half price on Amazon. The hardback of, hard, of count the ways is cheaper than the paperback is today. So you can get it as a great Christmas present. And if you love the book, you can pass it on. And that's, that's what, Sometimes I'll be criticized, you know, and somebody will say on my Facebook page, some, you know, kind of drop in person will say, oh, shameless. She's a shameless self promoter. I, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a person who, who works as a writer and works very hard. So yeah, I'm, I'm proud of my books. I want people to know about my books. I urge them to tell their friends about my books. Mm -hmm. I thank you for ta talking about my books and spreading the word, which really, um, is it's kind of the grassroots approach and that mm -hmm. has how and I know, do it. For me, I, I came to, I mean, I've, I've followed you for a long time, but it, when your second husband became ill and you were writing so beautifully about that every single day and sharing his story with us, it there was the things only that I can pull back. I could do at that point. It was, I did, uh, it's the only time in my life, you know, Carol, when I should explain um, for people who don't know that I, um, my my marriage to the father of my children ended when I was 35 and I was on my own for almost 25 years and in my late 50s met a really wonderful man it was mm -hmm. a pretty romantic way that we came together at that moment in life not young old enough to really treasure what we had he'd also been father of three children divorced for a very long time and we we just had the most wonderful time very briefly Mm -hmm. um, there's a picture that I think it's on my Facebook page from yesterday of a trip that we took to Paris when we had just met and Jim was a wonderful photographer but a year after we were married he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and um for 19 months I mean it's you know one of the worst kinds of cancer you can get I we did not accept that he was going to die we mm -hmm. fought it really hard mm -hmm. and I wanted to tell the story um and to sort of honor what Jim was doing, what we were doing as a couple. It was when it was the moment really in my life when I learned what it was to be part of a couple. Mm -hmm. um, Jim died six years ago, but during that period, those Facebook friends were my community. I, mm -hmm. I lived in hospitals and doctor's offices and mostly in hospitals. And I posted on Facebook. Um, mm -hmm. But the night that he died, 
I had written nothing for 19 months except for one modern love column. And this could sound, I don't think you're going to think I'm, I'm cold hearted or didn't love Jim when I tell you that I was in the bed next to him and I woke up in the middle of the night and I knew he was gone. Mm -hmm. He had been very close to death for, for several weeks, but I woke up and I put my ear to his chest and I knew he had died. And first I just lay there for however long, maybe an hour. And then I went downstairs. It was the middle of the night. There was no point calling anybody at that point. Mm -hmm. And I did what I had done all my life, which is to open my laptop. Well, it mm -hmm. used to be my typewriter. And I started writing. And that became actually what I wrote that night was the first were, were the first pages of The Best of Us, which was my memoir, mm -hmm. not about cancer or not about death, but really a love story. Um, mm -hmm. And um, that is what I believe in doing. I, mm -hmm. I believe in telling the story. Um, Sometimes it's a story I've lived and sometimes it's a story just from you lives in my, in my brain, you know, <laughs> it's very real. So I remember Labor Day. I mean, I remember where I was when I've read so many of your oh, books as well. Oh. And that's what's really, that's something funny I'll share later on. I'm not sharing that yet. But Debbie Moore is going to join us. Debbie has been on a number of events with us. We have some people that write in questions ahead of time and they also appear on screen. Oh, so great. Oh, what fun. I love this. Let me just see, where is it? Gallery, yep. So Debbie's going to come on. Debbie, is your, is your let me see, where'd you it's go? It's still, the video is still not working. Still, they still aren't working. Joyce, you're still here. You're, Joyce, you're still I, here. Um, I don't see myself, but I definitely haven't um, yeah, vaporized. I, let me see what's happening. Yeah. Okay. All right, so let's do it this way. Um, okay, so Debbie has some great questions. Debbie lives in upstate New York. And Debbie, take it away. And uh, Joyce, I love this book and it's so resonated with me. And oh. from what you've said this tonight, we are approximately probably the same age. I was born- I'm about to turn 69. I, my birthday is November 5th. I was born in 1953. Yeah, and I was born in 1952. And I grew up in New Hampshire. Really? I live in upstate New York, yep. Um, and so much of your story resonated with me. Um, and one thing I wanted to ask you, in your author's note, in the edition I read, you talk about that this book is a lot about forgiving and being forgiven. Yes. And I never had the feeling that Eleanor really forgave herself. I mean, her relationship with mm. Allie and Ursula improved and even with Cam improved at the end. But I feel like she always felt guilty. Um, that well, she was somehow responsible. And I think this is true probably of any parent. Isn't it? That if your I children's think, life aren't perfect, um, you I, feel I, responsible. This is what mothers in particular do. I, right. um, you know, one of the things that I do, I, I mostly write, but I teach, I teach writing at, um, not at any university. I created a workshop um, for only for women. And it's, for helping women tell their stories, partly because my story was, I was so condemned for telling mine years ago. Um, and I, I hear a lot of women's stories. Women come to me and often tell stories they've never shared with anybody and they carry an enormous amount of shame. Um, I, I think this is what what mothers in particular do is to feel if anything bad happens in their child's life, it's their fault. Right. Uh, <laughs> and so, you know, Eleanor is not meant to be an example of the way a woman should be. She's I wanted to explore the kinds of things that a woman does. Maybe they're not good things. You know, the level of self-sacrifice. Um, the degree, you know, she, as you may know, you do know if you read the book, she does not tell her children that their father had an affair. She's right. protecting their, with, with the babysitter, she's protecting the, the children and, and in the course of doing so, she gets blamed. Mm -hmm. um, right. Divorce. So is that the way women should be living their lives? Absolutely not. Is that the way many women do the, live their lives? Yes. Mm -hmm. Is that why I'm writing a sequel to finally have Eleanor get to a little better, you know, stage? Yes, absolutely. Um, I I do think that she 
you said something really interesting, Debbie. She she may not fully take herself off the hook, but I think she recognizes, as she didn't when she was younger, that her children have to live their lives, and she has to let go, let that cork person bob along, and she cannot always save them. Mm-hmm. And yes. that's that's a lesson. I mean, we're the same age, you know. You, I don't know that there's any shortcut to getting to that place. <laughs> I I could not. I've written novels that had divorce and divorce characters in them before, um, but I couldn't have written this one when I was thirty-five or forty-five, or maybe not even fifty-five, because I had to get to the place where I myself understood there's no bad guy. There's just you know a lot of people who all have their story, and they they may really hurt each other, but very few people intend to. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Um, the other question I had about, was about a uh, Toby, because he was my favorite character. Oh, me too. You're going to see lots more Toby in the sequel. I spent and, my day with Toby today. He's now 35. <laughs> you know, he was so honest and so grateful and probably had the least reason of anybody, but he was out to be that way, but he was so innocent and what was your purpose in writing the Toby character? Did you have a purpose in doing that or a I, story I, that you wanted to tell? It doesn't work that way for me. I will say I do not have a child who, thankfully, I do not have a child who had a t- traumatic brain injury and, you know, almost drowned in a pond and was not the same after. Mm. Uh, um, but I wanted, um, I wanted, I, I don't think I'll ever have a child die in a book of mine. I don't think I can ever do that. I'm not saying that one shouldn't. It's just, I can't go there. But I wanted to explore a parent's almost worst nightmare and coming out the other end of it. Because I'm interested in how we survive. I'm not, I'm less interested in what's going to destroy us than I am how we get through the hardest parts. And right. Eleanor thinks she can't get through. And she does. And Toby does. He's a completely altered person, Mm -hmm. but he's not a tragic figure. Mm -mm. He's having a full life. Um, And I wanted to show that. I mean, of course, more hard things are going to happen. You know, I have to give you hard things or there isn't a book, but but he is fundamentally a joyful, um, positive spirit. I love spending time with Toby. Yeah. They, they were such a great juxtaposition of Eleanor, who I don't think, except for maybe when she was very young, was ever really, really happy. So many things happened to her. But Toby mm-hmm. was just like perpetually happy. Yes. Oh, wait. Like, you, Eleanor's just getting some happy. happiness. Eleanor is getting some happy. Well, good. <laughs> <laughs> Only some of which comes in the form of a partner. But uh, <laughs> I, just I did not want to just give you a book where a man comes galloping along on a, you know, white <laughs> and solves everything but but she she was due to have a good partner don't you think yes i do and thank you for writing the book like i said it so resonated with me on so many different levels oh uh, it was thank it you. was just great reading it and I, and I loved your characters thank you well spread the word by all means i will i, will. I already <laughs> have thank you jim was really interesting is toby was the child with the little web feet web foot yeah. And when he felt, when he died in, the, where he, when he had his accident in the pond, I kept thinking like the little duck, like, oh, like oh, and I thought of that and I was like, oh my gosh, this is the kid with the little web foot, like a little duck. And oh he's still, my gosh. And I he's also the character who always had stones in his yes, pockets. And that's how the character he was taken down. Oh, it was really, really, really. Yeah. Um, let's see if we found Cindy. Did we find Cindy? I think Debbie's logging off too. Did we find Cindy? And if not, I'm going to ask Cindy. I'm so question. sorry, I didn't get to see Debbie. I might have <laughs> recognized her. New Hampshire is a small state. <laughs> I said, oh, I remember you. <laughs> <laughs> if you saw her in the food store, let her know. You know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> Thanks, Debbie, for joining us as always. Yeah. Debbie's always, she always says such good questions. If we can't find Cindy. I am going to shoot her question. Um, Cindy lives in Florida. And she says, um, you've written over 15 novels, including two memoirs. How did you approach carrying the waves when it parallels your life? Like, did you actually say, I think I'm going too far at this point, or I have to pull back, or I know Um, that emotion? I very deliberately, when I set out, and I often do this, I made, I, 
I made some things happen that had never happened to me just to be sure that I was entering into the territory of imagination. I scrambled up the children, their, their ages and you know the different sort of genders, the things that happened. I do not have a transgender child. I do not have a child who almost drowned in a pond. Um, and many other things in this book don't happen. I, I, I like it when people think that it's my life because that means I've done a good job. Um, but um, I don't, I mean, I guess I've said this before. I, I just dive in. It's, you know, it's swimming for me. I'm going to get in that water and, and see where I go. I don't, I, um, I think I'm a very instinctual writer. And so I, I follow where the characters take me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And just go from there. So you're going back to Yale after dropping out decades ago. That must have been a really unique experience. And well, what did you learn that surprised you? <laughs> well, I'll tell you a few things. Um, so just to backtrack, as, as, as I mentioned, you know, when I was 18, I, I gave up my scholarship. I left after freshman year. I was in the third class of girls at Yale. It was a huge opportunity. I was a small town girl from New Hampshire. Here I am, you know. And I left. And after that relationship ended, I could not go back. I could barely be in the world. I felt mm -hmm. so completely broken. Um, but almost 50 years later, 48 years later, after my husband Jim died, actually, I I wanted to find something hopeful. I I had been living with loss and seeing, you know, the person I loved leaving the world. And um I decided I'd go back to college. So I, I had to reapply. I was um, 64 years old at that point. They had to, they wanted to see my SAT scores from 1970. <laughs> well, and, um, I got in, I did not get a scholarship, which was a problem because I knew it was going to be really expensive and I wasn't going to be able to earn a living while I was going to college. So I had two and a half great years as an undergraduate at college. Um, and I did, I mean, I, I took a fabulous class in Frederick Douglass, Civil War, and I studied French, I studied Italian, I, I took art classes, which was always a love of mine. I have to say that my favorite part was the kids, the students. I loved being around the students. Some of them are still very much in my life. Um, they were much younger than my children, but, um, and they really educated me in, in ways that show up in my books because I, I learned a lot of things about, you know, young people today. I don't pretend to be, you know, without being one, you're not going to ever be an insider. But, um, and I will tell you a very odd and important thing that I learned at college. Um, I was, I was in my first semester. I have actually never talked about this in an, in an interview, but I will here. I was in my first semester back at school and I'd always been a good student. I'd always worked really hard to be a good student. And um, I was taking French and I love French. I love languages. And it's kind of a middle level French class, but I hadn't studied French in, you know, 48 years. Um, and I thought I was, I was going to be taking my very first exam of the semester. And I thought I was pretty darn good French student. I studied really hard. And, and I, the next day I went back into class thinking, you know, I think I got an A, maybe an A minus. And my teacher who I adored called me up after class me with all the 18 and 19 year olds, you know, and she hands me my paper and it has a D minus on it. I'd never seen a D minus on a paper in my life and in French. And then she said something to me that actually did change my life. And I, I, um, and it wasn't bad news. She said, um, have you ever been tested for learning differences? Of course, they don't call them disabilities. They call them differences. I hadn't. Nobody my age group, nobody my generation was. But the minute she said that, all these wheels began to turn. And my life sort of made sense in a way that, I, it, that I'd been carrying around this, this problem that I could never identify. I then was went off to, I don't even know how she knew it from my French exam, um, but I had very, very high level testing. I was at Yale, you know, so I had months of testing, which finally revealed to me, and I am not going to be ashamed in saying this, that I can barely read. Mm -hmm. I actually, um, I am a writer 
who reads in the 17th percentile. I do, of course, read, but reading, I am probably of all the people who are here listening, I may be one of the, you know, the least well read because reading a book for me takes a very long time. And I have to read the page over and over again to retain it. Um, I write very fluently. I write, like it's like an extension of my hands to be typing and telling a story. But when a friend publishes a book and it's a friend I care about and a writer I respect, I feel this sort of, oh no, I'm, how am I ever gonna get this book read? And I want to, I wanna talk to my friend about her book. Um, and I'm not, I don't keep the secret anymore. I say it, I, I have a learning difference and I won't even say this is sort of like a, a handicap. It, it includes a superpower, which is the other side as people, I don't know, you know, unless there are young people here listening, there may not be very many people who were tested, but you might have learned over the years that this applies to you, or you may have children who do. And it's such an important thing to know about oneself and to recognize the good part. I can focus like nobody's business. You could put me in a room with my laptop and I wouldn't even, that's why I wrote Labor Day in 12 days. I just, I just didn't stop. I was just gone. And I, I, um, so anyway, I learned that at college. I learned that I wasn't a very good student. <laughs> and I'm now a two-time Yale dropout, but that's okay. I never really went for the diploma. I went to study and learn and I did. Mm -hmm. So here's a question. How about listening to audiobooks? Can you do that? And the, the auditory part of it, can you hear? I'll um, tell you, um, the problem there is that um, if I'm, I won't just sort of sit and listen. It's very hard for me to be still. Oh, yeah. um, so no, audiobooks don't work too. And I, I hate saying that because I record audiobooks and I'm very proud of my own recordings. Mm -hmm. I, I won't let anybody else I let my 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 son Will as an actor and Labor Day had to be a male voice. So Willie recorded Labor Day really well. Um, but um, but I record all the books except the one that came out today, which I wanted to have a lot of different voices. Mm -hmm. um, so no, it's I'm just not ever probably going to be a great um, a great reader. I read poetry. Mm -hmm. uh, that's really important. Music is important. Art is hugely important to me. And mm -hmm. for me, going to an art museum is like being in a library. It's, yeah, it's it's a church. It's, yeah, it's, it's where you can go and really feel something and see something, but it's not the mm -hmm. right word. It's really, really yeah. wonderful. It's really, really wonderful. Somebody said that we're recording this so you could hear the rest. Yes, we are recording it, Barbara, and you will get a copy of it as soon as it's uploaded. It'll be um, both video and we will be doing a podcast. So if anybody does have to jump, we understand, but we want you to stay if you want to, because we're going to keep going. Um, Since, can I ask a question of everybody here? Sure, sure, sure. Because I, I, you know, it's very special and rare for me to be meeting with a group that has all or mostly read this book. I'd like to know what I'm not, I'm not going to say that I'll sort of crowdsource the book and give you what you want. And I'm, I'm, I'm deep in it now, but, but I would like to hear what you most want to see in this sequel, where, what, what are the questions that, that you would like to see addressed in this sequel? Do you know if everybody drops that into the chat, we can grab the chat later and send it Great. to you. I would I love that. I would love, send me a message. I will study them. And that will be my, that'll be my coffee break tomorrow. Um, yeah. my 10, I mean, I drink a lot of coffee while I'm doing this. <laughs> I bet you do. I bet you do. You know, it, it's really interesting because the way you're talking so honestly, which a lot of people put up a facade or whatever with you, I feel like whenever I've ever read anything of yours, it was the truth. It wasn't something that you were <laughs> testing around or doing anything like that. And sit there and say, this is what they really would like. And it's also like, I would really like to see, I think it really upset me that Eleanor so much was taking the brunt of everything with these children. And when she- You're not alone. You're not alone out, in being upset. I'm like, you finally are saying this. I mean, granted, it's like the, not the biggest moment that you do this, but like 
really? This is how you're finally going to say something after all this time when you, you didn't get to see your children. They didn't want to live with you. All these things didn't end up happening. So uh, somebody's saying they'd like to see the point of view of each of the children. That's interesting. I and actually am doing that. I Ooh. am, I, um, yesterday I, I, I let myself be Ursula for a while and mm -hmm. I wanted, it's a very interesting exercise to go into the head of a person that you might think you would disagree with and really work to see how life looks from their perspective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's Ursula talking about all the things about her mother that made her nuts, that made her mm -hmm. so she couldn't even stand being with her. And, um, uh, I'm seeing lots of messages. I'm, I'm going to, even if, if I don't address your, your, your question or your, your observation right now, rest assured, I'm going to be reading all of these. Yeah. We'll grab the chat later on because the chat is always so interesting to see what people say. Um, we've got Anna, who's going to join us right now. Anna's got a really good question, two really good questions as well. So great. Jordan, if we could find Anna, it'd be great. It's like, it's like, you know, they, they pop on, like it's, Yes. Some version of Anna White, you know, here we go. Yeah. <laughs> so Anna will be found. Here's oh, great. Anna. Hi. Hi, Hi, Anna. Where, where are you? I am visiting in New Jersey. I was the <laughs> one who was from Pennsylvania. Oh, yes. Okay. Um, I keep going back to the beginning because I like a memoir. Yes. And how you handled talking about Allison to Al just, I swear, I, I think I went a couple of chapters in and I went back because it was, there was no explanation. There was no detail. There was nothing. You just simply stated a fact. And how, how were you able to communicate that in Eleanor's head, she's dealing with two different children in her mind, but yes. yet she's only... Uh, interacting with one, but she doesn't discount the other. And it was so moving. And because I have a trans child oh. and I'm writing a memoir that oh. it doesn't have to do with him, but he's obviously an incredibly big part of the story. Of course. And that you made it so matter of fact, it was almost like he has brown hair. And yet you transitioned this child from one to another. And it was, how did you do that? <laughs> Just... uh, um, I'm not sure that I know the answer, Anna, but I will say that I mentioned earlier that one of the great gifts in my life has been working with women um, who trust me with their stories when they come to, to, to write memoir. I don't teach fiction writing, I only teach memoir. And they, they come to my workshop, which lasts for a week. And, um, and I have heard the stories of many, many women whose children have transitioned um, and I carry them with me. And um, I remember when my son, Charlie, the older of my two boys, um, was in high school, he, his best friend was at that point, a gay woman who later transitioned and transitioned fairly early on. You know, the, I mean, in the year 2000, it was a much more surprising thing to hear than now. Um, and I knew, I knew um, Charlie's friend really well. And he was uh, now he, um, a, a wonderful young person who's still in my life. And, um, I learned from those stories. I learned it's not this sort of, you know, this this tragedy that happens out there. You know, it's it's life. It's and in fact, I I learned from 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 Charlie's friend that this was good news. This was good news. His getting to where he really unifying who he always was, having his his outside and his inside match. You know. Um, but I didn't, um, it wasn't an intellectual choice for me. It almost never is. I mean, I'll say the same about, you know, there's Eleanor also deals with another situation that I have heard too many women talk about in my workshops, which is estrangement from an adult child and another, you know, just devastating event. I mean, more so really, I think, because, mm -hmm. um, you know, if you, 
if you are able to to welcome your child as who he or she or they really want to be seen, then that will bring you closer. Um, but I've known a lot of women who were certainly not perfect mothers, where mm -hmm. such a person, but mothers who tried their best, who loved their children, who for various reasons that, that, that they often do not begin to comprehend have been cut out of a child's life. And I wanted to explore that one. And that's a tough one because it doesn't just get fixed. Um, yeah. the, the transition, you know, um, publishers now have, um, have a person who steps in to read a manuscript. You're nodding, Carol, you probably know what I'm going to say, called a sensitivity reader. And there was, for this book, there was a sensitivity reader for um, a, a Latina sensitivity reader, and there was a, 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 a non-binary sensitivity reader. And this non-binary reader came back and said, um, this, this book shows evidence of homophobic behavior. And I said, really? Or transphobic, I'm sorry, transphobic. And I said, what do you mean? Because Eleanor did not just rejoice at the initial news of her child's transition. That's not human behavior. It's, I'm sure you have experienced- It's not that. reality. You have to grow and learn. And that's what happens in a novel. You change, you discover. You don't just say, yay. Um, I wanted to explore how how challenging it was. And I'm sure it was for you before you, you got- were talking, You were talking about the death of a child? Yes. and. In many ways, my daughter died. Yes. My daughter is gone. I've heard that said. I have heard and, that. And it's like, I, I love my son. Yeah. But I did have to grieve. I, yeah. And I still grieve. Yeah. You know, I, and I, you, thank you. you touched I totally, it. Yeah. I totally. And, and I thank you for it because you really touched it and um, how you did it because you, it, I'm more interested in, in, in the character of Eleanor and how she deals with her children and, and all of it. And that is where the, I just kept going back and just reading, because I think you did it in like two sentences. And I was, as a writer, it, it got me, but as a mother, it truly touched me. Oh, I'm coming from a parent who really knows the experience. Thank you. I, that means a lot. I, I, the only stories that I, I mean, I would not presume to write Al's point of view. I think that would be, I, I mean, I believe in that I, I'm, I'm not a fan of this whole, you know, notion that writers are, are no longer allowed to write characters that are not, you know, within their sphere of direct experience. I think that's, that's, you know, a violation of the nature of what writing is, which is imagination and expanding our, our universe. But there are some stories that I'm not equipped to tell. And I would not presume to write in the voice of a trans man. I think that would be offensive to mm -hmm. a trans man. Um, but I can write, I can imagine being the mother of a trans man or woman or, or non-binary person. Um, uh, I'll, I can take myself that far. Mm -hmm. And that's oh, going to be a very, yeah. very important book that you're writing. I, maybe one day you'll show up at my workshop. I would yeah. welcome you there. A dream come true. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for joining us. Thank you for your question. Um, this book has so much to talk about. We're going to go to Q&A with Tom Donatio as our voice of God answering the questions. Right. So Tom, All if you right. can take it away with the questions that we've got. Absolutely. Yeah, we have a few good ones here. Um, first, uh, we have a question from Carol. She says, what life experiences influenced you while writing this remarkable novel? Oh, gosh. Well, the obvious ones are, you know, marriage, parenthood, divorce, you know, I could, you know, children leaving home, um, you know, moments of alienation from one or another of my children, which have happened, um, uh, becoming a grandparent, I could name all those things. But I'm actually going to say something completely different that's not in the book at all, which is the death of my second husband. Um, and the months preceding the death of my second husband which really um, changed me as a person for the better. Um, I, I would give anything for that, for him to be alive, of course, but it, but 
if we cannot take any lessons from our losses, then, then our losses really were total losses. Um, and I think, I think for me, when I emerged from that experience, and it was brutal, it was my, you know, Gallipoli, um, and only one of us did emerge from that experience. Um, when I emerged from that experience, I was a kinder person. And things that, that used to be so important did not seem very important anymore. Um, and I really, I really do sort of mark, I was, um, I was 62 years old at that point. So this was long in coming, but um, I had carried myself a lot of bitterness about the end of my marriage. And, you know, as, as people do who, you know, who once loved somebody and now they're not with them. And, you know, I had just, I had, um, it was, you know, no doubt hurtful to my children, hurtful, most of all to me probably. And it melted away. I, I, I didn't, there wasn't space anymore for that kind of thing. So this really, this book I would say is, could not have been written when I was, I mentioned earlier when I was younger because I, I hadn't gotten to that place and there's probably no quick way of getting to that place. Um, it's just, right. life becomes very precious. Yeah, you definitely were in that when you find, realize it has an expiration date. Yep. <laughs> you sit there and you get, and it's like, oh, this is the expiration date, you know? Okay. Tom, is there another question? Yeah, um, Linda asks, would you please explain the symbolism of the ash tree? Mm. Oh, <laughs> I'm, you know, I didn't really have any symbolism. I just, I imagined a, a property which, which bears a certain resemblance to a farm that I lived on long ago. Um, and it needed to have a tree in the yard and, mm -hmm. and the tree should be big because it's an old place. And, um, and I wanted something big and surprising to happen at that wedding. You know, we know they're going to say they love each other. We know they're going to kiss. We do not think that a tree is going to crash down on a house. And, and I mean, you could say the obvious, you know, just at the moment that these two people are coming together, that the house that their family had lived in is smashed down. I didn't think of it that way. I just, I'm pretty cinematic. I think maybe I'm rather happy with the fact that two of my books have been made into movies. And I don't think it's a coincidence because maybe this is connected with the ADHD in a way. When I sit down to write, I imagine a movie. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean that I'm sort of saying, oh boy, I hope I sell the rights to Hollywood. I mean that I want a movie to play in your head. I want, I don't just want ideas and abstractions. I want scenes and characters and things to happen and big things to happen. And um, a tree falling down is a big thing. <laughs> so big thing. That was a good one. That was a good one. <laughs> yeah. Um, Lainey asks, um, how long did it take you to write Count the Ways and what advice would you give to aspiring writers? Well, <clears throat> one would be um, to I'll answer the I I wrote this book. Usually I write very, very fast. I wrote this book three times. I wrote it the summer before I went back to college, all in one big swoop, the way I've just done. And then I went to college and I didn't look at it for nine months because I was at college. And then the next summer I opened it up. That, that was fabulous to look at a book that you haven't looked at for nine months. And it's like a fresh book. And I rewrote it. I've never done that before. And then I went back to college and then was the pandemic. And I was... So I mentioned that I teach writing. I didn't say where, it's kind of an unlikely place. I mm -hmm. teach writing in a small Mayan village on the shores of the most beautiful lake in the world in Guatemala, where I have a house. And once a year, people come, um, a small group of about 12 people, and they stay at my house in little bungalows that I have, and I work with them. So in March of 2020, I went down there, not knowing if anybody would show up. And amazingly, eight women did even though they closed the airport and nobody was quite sure how they were gonna get home, but the US embassy eventually sent a plane. But I stayed on, I wasn't stuck, but I wanted to stay on. I actually invited two of the women from the workshop to stay on with me, thinking we'd be together for a few weeks. We were together for six months. And I rewrote Count the Ways during those months that were, it's a little, 
hard to say this when I know people suffered so much. I had a wonderful six months at the beginning of the pandemic mm -hmm. because every day I wrote and every night I brought my manuscript to the dinner table and under the stars looking out at the volcano and the lake, I read that book out loud. So I, for about two months, I completely rewrote Count the Ways and it was a new book. So I would say two months of two months and many years of thinking because writing doesn't just happen when you're doing this. Writing happens in your head when you're taking a hike or folding the laundry or swimming across a lake or not when you're shopping with your friends, but um, advice be brave. It is probably the bravest thing I do in my life. I'm not a snowboarder. I'm not a, you know, a mountain climber, but I'm brave when I write. I'm not afraid to go to difficult places to say difficult things. And I'm not sitting there worried about what people will think. Do not worry about what people think. Um, write like an orphan is what I say, whether you are one or not. I happen to have been one for a very long time, but you cannot be thinking, what's my mother going to think? Or what's my husband? Or what's my children going to think? Just do it. And I will say, great advice. I'm going to sell you something else. I actually have a, a, um, an 18 hours of a really fabulous writing class that's online that's very cheap. I think for 99 bucks, you can get the whole thing. That's Creative Live. And I strongly recommend it. Um, I'm very proud of um, all the teachings that I was able to get across in that in that class, but if I if I had to to distill it down to one thing, I'd say courage, be brave. I think that's a good line to end on, Tom. What do you think? Is that I a good think one? Think it is. Yes, absolutely. Oh, is. This has been so. Gosh, we were talking for a long time, but the I time know. flew. <laughs> the time flew. Well, I have um, to tell you, Joyce, Thanksgiving is coming, and I need to book a Zoom session with you. To teach me how to make a pie crust because I've watched you do this umpteen I times. Do I can do it like nobody's business. And I sit there and lay out the Trader Joe's pie crust. So I I've always, to um, Carol, I always post it. I have a class that I that a little video that I always put up right before Thanksgiving. So I'm there. I'm there. <laughs> I'll be watching. I'll be watching. Thank you it's so much for the um, this special evening. So, so, so appreciated your time. And check out, check out the influencer by all means. Yes. We are ready. And we're going to figure out Tom, how to talk about that on the site as well. We'll be putting that in the newsletter tomorrow. So Such how's a, that? Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Really, really, really appreciate your time. And we'll be in touch for sure. I'm looking and, forward to those chats. <laughs> looking forward to those chats. And here we go next. Our next Bocaccino Live event will be next month on Wednesday, November 30th at eight o'clock. And our guest is going to be Charmaine Wilkerson, who's going to be talking about her debut novel, Black Cake, which I had interviewed her when that book came out last year. Registration for this event will be available tomorrow. Um, remember that tonight's event will be available on YouTube and on a podcast probably beginning of next week. And we'll alert you when that is live. And reminder, we've got 150 interviews that we've done, book reporter talks to interviews. Look for them on our YouTube channel, our book report network, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And to stay on top of what we're doing with Book Reporter Network, Bookachino Live, everything that we're doing, sign up for our newsletter because you'll never miss anything that happens then. So we thank you so, so much for being um, a part of this evening. It was special for Joyce. It was special for us. And we appreciate all of you for joining us. And we will be sharing that chat with us. Make sure Jordan rips that for us and we can get it off to her. So thank you so, so very much for being part of our evening. <laughs>